Good evening, everybody, wherever you are. My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm very glad to welcome you here this evening for a special conversation with Michaeline Ducleff and Ned Johnson. We're here to talk about Michaeline's new book, Hunt, Gather, Parent, What Ancient Cultures Can Teach Us About the Lost Art of Raising Happy, Helpful Little Humans. So again, it is really our pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, if you would like Spanish interpretation, we have with us tonight, Cynthia Hinestrosa. So there are instructions in the chat, if you would like, again, Espanol. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a globe. You can click on Spanish for, again, simultaneous Spanish interpretation. We are delighted again, as I said, to be here with you tonight. And we're grateful for the sponsorship of the Sequoia Union High School District, the Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and the organization, The Parent Venture, which is the nonprofit um, of which I'm a co-founder that brings you the Parent Education Series. Tonight, most of you are familiar with the Zoom webinar format, but for those of you who are not, we are going to be, again, in webinar. So you have two options to communicate with us. The first is the chat button. Many of you are familiar with, so my partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting resource links in the chat. So look for that. You can also send messages to us, the panelists, and chat to one another. For questions tonight, and we hope that you have some since this is a conversation, we wanna hear from you. And there is a Q&A button, so please do put your questions in the Q&A. So chat for resources and comments, but questions in the Q&A button. Uh, at the very end, you'll see a link to a very short survey, about one minute. We hope that you will fill it in. That helps us with future planning for parent education programming and also tells us a little bit for our funders. Tonight, I'd like to tell you more about, oh, one last thing. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available on our video library, which is a free resource for parents with over 32,000 views in the last couple of years. We know that this resource has become a popular and trusted place for parents to find quality information. All of our previous parent education series events are listed on the video library. So let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured presenters. First of all, Michaeline Ducleff, PhD, is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Hunt, Gather, Parent. This book describes a way of raising helpful and confident children, which parents and caregivers have turned to for millennia. It also explains how American families can incorporate this approach into their busy lives. Duclef wrote the book after traveling to three continents with her three-year-old daughter, Rosie. Maya, Inuit, and Hadzabi families showed her how to tame tantrums, motivate kids to be helpful, and build children's confidence and self-sufficiency. Duclef is also a global health co correspondent for NPR Science Desk, where she reports about disease outbreaks and children's health. She holds a doctorate in chemistry from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's in viticulture, and Enology from the University of California, Davis, and a BA from Caltech. Michaeline currently lives in Alpine, Texas with her husband, daughter, and German Shepherd, Savannah. Ned Johnson is a favorite of the Parent Education Series and an author, speaker, and founder of Prep Matters, an educational company providing academic tutoring, educational planning, and standardized test preparation. A professional tutor geek, since 1993, Ned has spent more than 40,000 hours helping students conquer standardized tests, learn to manage their anxiety, and find the motivation to reach their full potential. He is also co-author of the book, Conquering the SAT, which tackles the outsized role anxiety plays in standardized testing. He is the host of the Prep Talks podcast and a sought after speaker and teen coach on study skills, sleep deprivation, parenting dynamics, and test anxiety. He is also the co-author with Dr. Bill Stixrud of the books, The Self-Driven Child and What Do You Say? Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Michaeline Ducleff and Ned Johnson. Take it away, Ned and Michaeline. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. I love the work, Bill and I, and I know Michaeline, love the work that you and Bev do in bringing resources like this wonderful book uh, to your, your parent uh, community there. So, uh, and I am a, uh, I've had the honor to uh, speak with Michaeline bef before. I, I, it's a terrific book and I really look forward to, uh, to digging in on this. So, um, 
your, of course, background is as a scientist and NPR um, uh, science correspondent. So as much as I think all of us would really love for you to spend the next hour telling us everything we need to know, or maybe don't want to hear about the, the Omicron variant, <laughs> um, probably like, okay, we'll move past that one. So, but, but, but really how, I mean, total science nerd to writing this really cool book about parenting that like, how did that happen? I know it's crazy, right? Like, um, you know, I, I had this, we, we kind of got fell in, I kind of fell into this without actually kicking and screaming, to be honest. <laughs> um, you were Rosie. <laughs> yeah, both of us, both. both of us. So Rosie is my daughter. She's six. She actually fell asleep tonight at 6.30. So um, it's, it's 6.30 Central Time. So yes. if you have any doubts about the last chapter on sleep working, well, there you go. She's asleep. Although she may wake up and come in. Um, <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so I am a total geek. I've been a geek since I can remember. I did. I love to do algebra with my grandpa. I went, this is not in the book, but when I was, you know, like in second grade, I'm a huge, huge science nerd. I went to Caltech and Berkeley. And I really, really thought that like I was going to parent with science. And there is this like kind of thinking out there right now that like, you know, scientific evidence is going to tell you how to be a good parent. And I really thought that was the case. And there is room for science and parenting. Absolutely. You know, vaccines, nutrition, you know, these very physiological things. And, and as the book shows, and your book shows too, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in neuroscience and psychology, but when it comes down to it, um, parenting is actually really a craft. And this is what I was kind of kicking and screaming about. So mm. about almost four years ago now, Rosie was two and a half. And like I say in the book, like we were really struggling. Like she just, Rosie is an amazing kid. She is super smart. She's super strong, super persistent, funny. I mean, she's just great, but she's also like a big pain in the butt and really like hard to handle as a baby. She cried a lot, um, cried all the time. And then when she was about two and a half, two, two and a half, she really started having these like very severe, very hard to handle tantrums. And, um, you know, I read all these books and I thought science was going to save me. Like I read books, I read studies, I read the New York Times, I read everything. And I would try everything. And a lot of times things got worse. Um, and a lot of times I felt like our relationship was getting worse, that we were arguing more. I was arguing with a two, three-year-old. At the same time, with, for my job at NPR, they sent me down to this little Maya village in the Yucatan to do a story about children's attention. There's been some really interesting studies on attention in kids, um, indigenous kids in Mexico and, the U and American kids. And I went down there and I totally was focused on attention and neuroscience and, um, but what, like the experience I had during this week period where I spent, you know, th four or five days really with a few families, um, mostly moms, um, really totally shifted everything I thought parenting could be. Um, I, the, what these women showed me, this one woman, Maria, who's in the book, Maria uh, de los Angeles, she showed me a way of parenting that I had never seen before or experienced. Um, and, and at the time I knew it was really significant. I talk about in the book, like I'm sitting at the airport at the end and I actually took my phone out and like wrote down everything, all these ideas. And they, a lot of them ended up in the first couple of chapters of the book. Um, Basically, I thought children and parents had to argue all the time. There had to be all this <laughs> conflict and stress. And, um, you know, to raise a really good kid, you kind of had to be mad at them and angry at them and kind of force them to do things. That's how I was raised. That's how I was raising Rosie. Um, and what Maria and a couple of the other families in, in the Yucatan show me was actually there's a whole other way. Um, and this way is likely the elements of it are likely the way parents have been parenting for thousands of years. It's the way mm. parents parented in the U across the U S very commonly a hundred, 150 years ago, you can still find pockets of it in the U S. Um, and it's in many ways easier in many ways builds this connection with children. That's really beautiful and wonderful. And like I say in the book, it minimizes conflict and really maximizes cooperation. And I think you know, you, you talked about what Ned is an expert in, you know, anxiety, stress, sleep deprivation. I think a lot of these, these, these problems that we have, these issues that we have with kids has a root in it that we've, we've lost the skill and the knowledge of how to collaborate with them. 
how to work together with them and build this, this relationship that's really based on trust, love, and, and cooperation and um, respect. Um, and, and, and that's really what this book is about, is like bringing back that knowledge. And it's not something that you're born knowing. You know, it's something that you're really taught um, often through other people, but hopefully through a book as well. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's my little story. Um, you know, after I got back from the, the Yucatan, I thought this parenting approach was like specific to the Maya, but it took about another nine months and I went up to the Arctic for a different story. And I saw a very similar approach um, with very, with like four or five core elements. And then I started reading about it and realizing that, okay, there's this kind of universal theme that you can find um, where really wherever you go, if your eyes are open to it. I love all that, you know, in, in that, 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 that th there's really a through line in your book about, um, about this cooperation, about this collaborative problem solving, about kids work, parents working with kids in part because kids are working with parents. And, yeah. and to your point, it's, you know, it very much this craft, but also, of course, a huge amount of science of neuroscience that supports this approach. Um, and so that this, these things do, these things are, of course, cultural. But we also know from science epigenetic, meaning what, what people experience affects the genes. And then we kind mm. of cascade, you know, like, like trauma can go through mm. generations. Mm -hmm. Peaceful parenting can then affect ge generations all the way through. Mm. And, and, and it's, I mean, these, these stories are, yeah, <laughs> they're so fun to read because in some ways you're like, really? I mean, come on, sister, do people really do this? And, <laughs> and, right? But, but, to, but to your point, you know, that it wasn't just the minds, right? And you saw this in Inu and you saw this in Hazabi. And I think, I think it's easy um, if, we, if we don't have the experience that you've had to sort of think, well, those people over there, um, yeah. you know, like there's somehow these, you know, mystical rare things. You make the point though, that it's really we Americans are more broadly Westerners who are the weird ones. And I love, yeah. I love this part of it. Can you, can you walk us through what that means and, and, and how you, uh, and, and well, because it's not, it's not parents, not just, well, you tell the story. <laughs> yeah. You know, in this idea too, that it's like the others is so interesting. You know, one of the reasons we used to live in San Francisco, right? So we lived in, we've lived in the Bay area for like 15 years, my husband and I, and we just moved to Alpine, <laughs> Texas, very rural Texas. And, you know, one of the reasons why we moved here is the parenting is here. I mean, it is absolutely here. It's hard to, mm. it, it's in the, it's in San Francisco too. I have seen it once I understood it, but it's a lot more common here. So this is not something that's rare at all. In fact, like you say, the, the approach that we take to dealing with children is really the outlier. So about 10 years ago, a group of researchers started looking at, so first of all, the vast majority of psychological research, um, is, is done on a very tiny part of the population of the world. So basically European American, middle-class, upper middle-class, and really people, those people that live in academic communities. So this is a very <laughs> tiny slice of the world. And there's this kind of, like you say, a through line through that academic research that this is the norm, that we kind of, these people are kind of you know, universal. This is how everyone acts. Um, but in fact, if you look at the small fraction of studies that are done on other people besides this very small group, what you find is this group, you know, European American middle class people is actually really strange. And that a lot of, on a lot of psychological tests, we, me, are the outliers. Um, and that other, other groups, other cultures tend to be closer uh, together and tend to kind of represent more of a universal way of being. Um, and so these researchers gave it an acronym of WEIRD, Western Educated Industrialized Rich Democratic. This is where you find this weird psychology. And there's, there's a whole handful of things that we do weird. One of the things that really strikes me is even like visually we're weird. So like there's um, optical illusions with lines that that we are um, succumb to, that we think, you know, two lines are actually not equal to each other when they are. And that, you know, if you bring this test around the world to many, many cultures, they wouldn't be fooled by these optical illusions. So this, um, this psychological weirdness that we have goes deep. It goes deep into like, even just our visual um, processing. Uh, and so they have this term weird and there's a um, anthropologist at U Utah State University, David Lancey, who, who, David Lancey, who his whole life has studied childhood around the world from the 70s. He really pioneered the, the field of um, 
child anthropology and looking at children. And, um, and he started back then documenting all the weird things that we do parenting. And he has documented about 50 things that we do. Um, again, European American, primarily middle class, um, middle upper class that um, you can't find really anywhere else in the world, or it's very, very rare. Um, so we kind of think our what we do is like the right way. Even one of my friends called it like the optimal way, like you're optimizing the optimal, Mike Lane. Um, and, or, and it's also very traditional. Um, but in fact, it's all those things are completely wrong. It's not traditional. It's not rooted in history. It's not rooted in science. We often think it's rooted in science. Um, but in fact, it's really weird. And a lot of the stuff we do isn't necessary. And it's very stressful. It's very stressful for the parents. And it's I think a, a big cause of stress for um, children. And so a lot of this book is trying to say, okay, let's step back a little bit, look at some of these things that we do, are they necessary? Um, and what's another way of doing it? Like, can we fill up our parenting toolbox a little bit more with other ideas that might work better for some kids um, than the, the route that we are told to do? So I'll, 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 I'll put on the hat of devil's advocate and say, so what's the problem with, with kids being stressed, right? You know, it's, you know, spoil the, spare the rod, spoil the child. You know, that was good enough for, I don't know, the Puritans or whatever. And doggone it, we're the, you know, the world's most powerful country. Where's the, where's the, where's the problem there? Yeah, you know, I think you could find this in the Puritans, a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not some of the, um, maybe not some of, of the, you know, the more peaceful purchase, but um. Um, well, I mean, you can tell me, I learned all this from you. <laughs> you know, this is where we really start to look at some of the problems that we have, right? So, um, you know, I, I, chose the, we ch I chose to focus on the Maya, the Inuit and the Hadzabe. Well, one, I have connections in two of those cultures, but, um, you know, pretty deep connections now, but also because they really um, thrive in aspects of parenting that we struggle with right? So we think it's hard to raise a helpful child, right? We think it's, it's hard to get a child to do the dishes, you know, to clean up their, to do their, make their own bed, right? To do very minimal things when in fact, the norm is a very helpful 10, 11, 12 year old. Like by the time you're 10, you're helping to take care of other kids. You're providing some type of food or some, you know, you're providing something for the group. Um, a child is, um, and you have a lot of adult skills in the terms of helping the family. And one could make a really strong argument that, that a helpful child is evolutionarily more what kids are designed to be than this right. stubborn, obstinate child. So that's a big one, right? This, this, and, and, and I would also say, not just from the desi desire of having help around the house, but I think that you could make a really good, bit, really good argument that a helpful child also contributes to a mentally healthy child because children, if you look at like some um, evolutionary biology and some primatology, you know, looking um, kind of deep at our, our roots, um, one of the things that, that makes us human and that makes us human children is this desire and this need to help and contribute. And when we take that away from a child, I think we cause a lot of stress. So the Hadzabe is probably where you're really getting at. So, um, you know, one of the big problems when, when Rosie was born, I really thought, you know, I want Rosie to go to Harvard and I want Rosie to do all these things that I didn't get to do for whatever reason academically and like, you know, and Caltech and, and Berkeley, such a slouch, <laughs> a slacker, give me a break. <laughs> no, but this is the mindset, right? That nothing right. is kind of enough, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. That was the mindset. And, um, and then you look at the data and you're like, wait a second what is going to happen to Rosie most likely is that she's going to be anxious. She's going to be depressed and she's going to end up at a college without skills and with a lot of potential mental health problems, because that is the, one of the big problems we have in our culture right now is, you know, a third of kids, right. End up with some anxiety or depression by the time they're 18. And you look at us as a group like the Hadzabe um, and th th there's nothing like this. Mm. This, this um, childhood anxiety, this childhood depression is just it's unheard of. And I think if I could put a point in there, one of the things that is helpful for all of us to, as parents or, or as scientists to remind ourselves that so much of the work of childhood is really the, the brains develop in the ways that they're used. 
right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you are chronically stressed, you're going to have a brain that is highly vulnerable to being chronically stressed. And if you're stressed long enough, you end up being depressed. And, um, you know, it's lovely to go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford. These are all wonderful places. But, you know, to, to end up at, you know, to achieve everything and then have a brain that's depressed and you can't enjoy it, that's not going to be, you know, depression doesn't give a fig about, you know, college or career success. So, so I think for, you know, for obviously people who are, who are the, the, the community out there where, where in Palo Alto, wildly interested in kids being academically successful, you know, and this is the work that I do. I, what I love about this book is we is is the, is the a, a science based and, and certainly a culturally based our argument can be made that it's not an either or oh, that you can end up with sure. kids who are who are wildly confident and super competent right and 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 self driven to use the you know the title from our book to want to do to want to do well and help their families and you know I don't know maybe do the dishes once in a while without being asked seventeen times so that would be you know it seems like a good thing. You know, something I learned from your book, that the second book, not the, that, that- Oh, you read the really, second book. I'm sorry. I Thank did. You. Thank you. Um, that, I, that has really stuck with me is this idea of also teaching children to be calm, teaching mm. children to have flow, to have experiences that, you know, maybe aren't going to help them get good SAT scores, but help them relax help them learn to do, you know, help them to learn to have hobbies or activities that are calm and peaceful, um, that are not do dopamine rushes. You know, my big thing yeah, right yeah, now yeah. is anti-dopamine, you know, and, and doing the dishes with your parents, like a lot of cultures around the world enjoy these, these kind of routine. I mean, it sounds really hokey, but enjoy these routine parts of life that are, that are social, right. That you're with your family mm -hmm. that are kind of sculpting. Like you talk about a mind, a mind that knows how to relax, a mind that knows how to be peaceful, how to do nothing for a moment. Well, you know, and if, these are rejuvenation, right? This is rejuvenation. So right? If I could throw in two points there, one, you know, my partner in scribe Bill Stickshirt is a clinical neuropsychologist when he gushes on me a little bit, makes the point. I mean, I'm for folks who don't know, I'm kind of this over, overpriced test prep guy in Washington, DC. And part of the reason I help kids be more successful on tests because we approach these tests and the preparation and give them tools to be to be able to be more calm because at some level, it doesn't matter how hard you work to like shove everything into kids' brains. If under too much pressure, they, they sort of lose their minds, right? And so we, yeah. if, 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 if the, the nature of the vessel has to matter at least as much as the content of it. And I love that you brought up washing dishes. I, I love washing dishes. I love doing yard work in part because, and if you told folks in, 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 indulge me a little bit in, in kind of geeking out on the science, there's a part of the brain called the default mode network, which only activates when you're not actively doing something. And so mm. it's when it's, it's kind of a mindless task of, 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 of doing the dishes or you're driving, you know, on the road, you've been there a thousand times, you're quilting, right? If you are a walk in the woods and what happens is even just closing your eyes or certainly during meditation and the default mode network consumes about 70% of the brain's energy. And it's involved in things like, problem solving, mm. you know, putting things into perspective, developing a sense of empathy. And, and most importantly for teenagers, and this is why we love Silicon Valley and, and thank you, Facebook and Google, but that's okay. <laughs> Apple as well, right? When, when it, it, it's involved in developing a coherent sense of ourselves, right? Mm. Because when we're not actively doing something, I reflect on my past, I reflect on my future, you know? So mm. did I, I think I might've made Chris, you know, Michael Lean a little upset about that. Let me think about that again. And we, we think about these things, we put things into context and there's something really challenging if we have kids be busy all the while or stressed mm. all the while as though productivity is all the, is, is everything. Because so much of what looks like kids learning is really just healthy brain development. And so, as you described so so well in the book, you know, it's it, it, particularly in the mind, you, you know, that these are these are modern people. These are people going to school. These are people going to university. These are people becoming economists, becoming mathematicians. It's not like they're, I don't know, you know, tribal people from 500 years ago where the, the, all they're doing is trying to get enough firewood for the day. Yeah. And so, so uh, you know, it, it and and that was really helpful to me because I'm, I'm my my worldview is 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 pretty you know American and Eurocentric. So I really appreciated that. That's so interesting, and I I um and so I think that this is a skill though. I think. Like you, you can't you can't be in front of a TV, a screen, you know, a, a class instruction, 
20, you know, all your waking hour and then tell a kid, okay, go out and have your default network start activating. You know, this mm-hmm. is something that kids, I think from my personal experience too, that you learn, you, you cultivate this skill mm-hmm. of, of being in this mind mindset and, and understanding what the mindset is doing. And, and I think this isn't that in the book, but, but all that skill is in the book, right? It's about mm-hmm. letting children. So I would also say this, we think there's like one way of learning. There's one way of being productive and that's through class and in prep in these like very intense kind of learning experiences, right? Yep. And in fact, kid, there's a whole other way of learning that I wanna do a piece about that David Lancey actually thinks is kind of going away. Um, and, and I think it's a skill that would be, is incredibly useful for kids as they go into the workplace. And so I think integrating that type of learning into your parenting is going to help kids in school, going to help kids in the workplace. Um, I can talk about that. But I also think learning how to be cooperative Mm -hmm. is is going to give a child huge advantage in life in a business setting, um, in an academic setting, um, because it's a skill that a lot of kids don't have. And it and it actually, you know, once I'm 45 now. I really learned how to, co- school didn't teach me to cooperate. My parents didn't, but I've learned through writing this book and with these people and reading um, how, to be, how to be cooperative, how to be collaborative. And it has helped me enormously in my job. It has helped me enormously with this book and it has made me a happier, uh, less angry, <laughs> less stressed person. I mean, how could how can you not, want that for your child, right? right? This skill that's going to give them advantage, I think, against somebody who doesn't have this, who's very highly competitive and doesn't know how to cooperate. And it's it's going to give them a peace of mind because there is a lot of new data coming out um, about what makes us happy, what gives us joy. And it is about connecting. It is Mm -hmm. about giving. It's about helping others. It's about connection. There's a wonderful um, psychologist at UC Irvine, Belinda Campos, who has this wonderful data where it really shows that joy and positive emotions are what kind of give us that extra boost to help others, to, to sacrifice ourselves, to you know say, hey, I'm going to let this other person shine. I'm going to do this for this other person because that makes me feel good. Right, right, so right. If, if your kid is just kind of in this individualistic competitive world, they're missing out on this this whole aspect of, of what brings us joy, right? What brings us positive feelings. Well, um, I'll, I'll make one point on that and then I'll pivot for people who are like, yeah, I, I don't care about happiness. I just want them to be successful. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pivot back and suggest and make and try try to make the case that these things that can that, that are tied up with collaboration that can bring us happiness can also make us be successful. And we'll come back yeah. to your point about attention. Um, what, so in, in our book, some of the research we look at on happiness is Martin Seligman, you know, who really founded the, the, the whole study of positive psychology and uses the acronym of PERMA you know, of the, of the attributes, the, the things that contribute to happiness. So some of it's positive emotion in, in, you know, those are practices out of, you know, greater good out in, in the, in the, in, in Berkeley of, of gratitude and awe, but also just kind of how you're wired. And there's, there's obviously neurological differences there, but then engagement in really hitting the three that you're talking about deep engagement. So that flow experience of whether it's soccer or music or you know, fixing the, you know, lawnmower, just being deeply engaged in this activity, whether it's good for college or not, relationships, and then meaning, oh. things that give us a deep sense of meaning. So whether mm. that's, you know, I, we, we did work out here with the Wounded Warriors and I w- worked with this guy who had, had a very short tour in, in um, Baghdad before he got blown up with an IED. And he was just really annoyed because he didn't get to do what he, how he really wanted to contribute to this America. And I said, he said, my whole family has, you know, was in military. I said, how many, how, how many of you in your family? He said, I was the eighth generation U.S. military armed services. Mm. I said, I'm sorry, what? I said, what is that, like the Revolutionary War? He said, yeah, wow. yeah. And so, I mean, you know, he, he experienced the world differently than do, than do I, but I can't tell you what gives you meaning and you can't do the same thing for me either. Um, so I, you know, again, you know, I, I help kids get into college. I want them to be as successful as they can. So I don't know, they can go off and become 
I don't know, NPR science correspondents because we want to develop those skills, right? But we want kids to be happy once they get that achievement. So what I want to do is pivot back to these, these, these skills that are involved in collaboration, I think mm -hmm. in cooperation, I think we can also make the case are vital to a motivation, which was important for performance. But, mm -hmm. but can you go back and I was just rereading your, your piece about attention and how you first got into this, mm -hmm. because I'd love to talk about, well, can you tell the story about how you're studying attention, what you realized about this? Yeah. So, gosh, this is like deep back. This is like 2018. No, no, no worries. <laughs> I can but help. You, I've been I've been loving it. OK. This is interesting work, right? Because yeah, what I think neuroscientists, I think there's a group a pair at Boston University. I think they're there. What they were telling me was so they study motivation, right? Mm -hmm. and like what gets people to pay attention and um, sorry, they study what gets people to pay attention. They have these like um, tests, right, that they give people and how, and they measure how long kid, kids and people can do these tests, right? right? And they think that they're measuring attention span at some level. Right. And, and that's a test they, they use when they, when, they, when they screen kids for ADHD, for attentional oh. issues. But in your situation, again, they're just kind of looking at the whole population of sustained attention. Yeah, and they're like studying yeah. what's happening in your mind, like they do yep. a bunch of MRI, MRI stuff. And so it's a very like, what is attention in, in the brain? And, and what they told me, which was so fascinating and so fit so well in, I, you know, after going and visiting the, the Maya families, was that they realized they weren't measuring attention at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, there was some component to it, but what these tests were actually measuring was motivation. Right. So how much was the kid motivated to, to pay attention, to do right. the task. So not, well, not rather not, if I repeat that back, not were they capable of paying attention, but did they want to pay attention? Do they have a reason to pay attention? Is that about that right? That is right, that is yeah. right. And there are some kids that they were telling me that, you know, really just want to, they have are highly motivated by like a game or by yeah. a test score. And like, I'm that kid, like I was that kid, like I just have to get an A, right? And this like very like, and these are the kids that you think have really good attention spans. Now, my husband, who has probably, you know, technically had a much more successful career than I, got terrible grades, couldn't care less about, he went to Caltech too, but couldn't care less about grades and like, what's the use of that? Who cares, right? This is just letters, huh. you know? And so he was never motivated in, you know, to, to do well in school, right. but he has an amazing attention span, right? And so it's like, what these people told me was that, that what we think of as intention really is about motivation and like learning how to motivate a child um, and what underlies intrinsic motivation, this like internal drive to do something, you know, how can you press on those buttons? It's not about just getting the kid to be more attentive and like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's really about pressing on their internal motivations and, and what, what are the components of that? I mean, that's really what your book is about. And, and what's incredible is your book, Self-Driven Kids, landed on my desk right around the time when I was in the Maya community and I was reading about how the parents motivate the kids and it overlapped completely. It was like the Maya families had like, they could have written your book. In the same way. <laughs> Would have you saved me a lot of half her, man, but they, anyway. <laughs> you know, and they were, they, they were kind of masters at using this knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so to give a little bit of background, like the Maya a lot of research has been done with Maya and other indigenous groups in Mexico and Central America, where the kids are incredibly motivated to help around the house. So they raise these, these kids who are, you know, by 10, 11 are like voluntarily doing chores. They're not paid. They're not forced. They're not punished. Kids, like I say in the book, I, there, I watched a 12 year old on her spring break, wake up at like 10 o'clock, walk past me and start washing the dishes from um, the breakfast without anyone asking her. And, and I went over and I asked her, her name's Angela, she's 12 at the time. I said, you know, why did you after do that? You, after, you, after you picked your jaw up off the floor. Yeah, yeah. Right. and I was like, what, what is she doing? And her mom was like, well, you know, she's 12. She should know what to do by now, right? That this, this is a skill that her mom has taught her to want to do it, not just do the dishes as a skill, but want to do the dishes. Um, and, and yeah, she was not, and she was not that surprised at all. And then I went over there and I asked her and she said, well, I want to help my mom. I love my mom. And, um, and you know, this is a kid that has extracurricular activities, goes to school, you know, like you, if you saw her, you would not, you would think that she's from the Bay Area. She, you know, she's just a modern kid, like you say. Um, but she has this internal drive through 
you know, this really devotion and love to help her family. And, um, and I would argue that that is just as important to a child's mental health as anything else you're going to read about in books. That, that wanting to help, being allowed to help, knowing how to help, having the help accepted. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This is what, and, and you can start that very young, very young. Yeah, you, in, in that that article you had um, from I forget who the, the the maybe it's the same researcher said it, it may be the case that some American children give up control of their attention when it's always managed by an adult. Oh yeah, this is huge. So I well, love this is that. Going, this is going back to what is um, what are those elements that push on motivation and push yeah. on attention, right? And the top one is is autonomy, right? Yeah. Is, is this um, the feeling that you have control, right, right. Of, your, of yourself? Um, and, and if you think about it, if a parent is always telling a child what to do, what to pay attention to, look over here, look over here, what is this, right? This, this, is, this is a very intense parenting style that we do. Yeah, yeah. What about this? What about this? Look at this, like these very, um, the child never learns to pay attention for themselves. What should I pay attention to? Another thing that Suzanne told, Suzanne Gaskins, my anthropologist told me, mm -hmm. she said a child will see to the parent any, anything that the parent takes responsibility for, right? Repeat that one more time because I think all of us should like internalize that. <laughs> like a child will over time see to the parent anything that the parent is taking charge of. So one of the huge differences that you see, and that there's some beautiful studies out um, on this recently, is what, what role does the parent play in the child's life? So yeah. a Maya parent will say, a, 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 a European American parent will say, I'm, I'm kind of a, a manager of the child, manager yeah. of the child's attention, manager of the child's schedule, manager of the child's goals. You, you, know, you are the, micro, the manager, right? And the Maya parent will say, you know, I support. I see hmm. where the child is going. I see their interest, what they want, I support. So Suzanne talks about this, like with a little baby, you know, the, the American parent is out there, the European American parents out there, like holding the baby's arm, saying, come on, walk, walk like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the Maya parent is behind the baby, not touching them, but ready to catch them when they fall. Hmm. So, the, so the child thinks they have full autonomy. They have, they're fully in charge. But actually, there's somebody by, behind them. And this is really what you're, you're talking about. The child feels like they're in charge. They feel like they have autonomy over their attention, over what they're doing, their schedule. But the parent is back there kind of watching and like guiding and supporting. And I think that, so it's not throwing up your hands and saying the kid can do whatever they want. They can pay attention to whatever they want. It's being there as a support. That's what mm. I think this is a major a major difference. I don't know if this like, is getting completely yeah, no, off track. I, no, I think it's I think it's great. You know, I mean, because your story in the in the book, uh, um, I forget the child's name, but the, the four year old who was going off to do to get, um, you know, to do shopping, and and her dad's well, of course she can handle this, right? And and again, it, you know, she she knows how to look out for traffic. She knows to get eggs or, or whatever. And you think four years old, right? In America, I mean, again, you know, Lenora Skenazy, you know, you be in jail, you know, for right. because, you know, free range kids, you're right to jail with you, lady. Um, but the, you know those elements, just to, to touch on them really quickly, of intrinsic motivation, of self-determination theories, that you need to feel competent, you need a sense of relatedness, and you need a sense of, of autonomy. And so in that experience of, of parents supporting kids, as you say, and supporting and doing things that they can do well enough. And, and you, may, you, you do such a nice job in telling the stories of, do they do things perfectly? No, because the default assumption is they're children. And right. they will make mistakes and they will do things progressively. And, you know, and you talked about making the tortillas, right? And, it, and, it, and, and the, you know, an expert mom could do, you could do it. And, and the kid is simply slowing them down, but they know that it's important for the kid to feel competent. They don't get criticized, right? Yeah. Feel that relatedness. I'm helping mama. Maybe, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that they are, and but they I'm just feel with that her. they are, right? I'm just, I'm just with her yep. and she is accepting me there. Yep. She's not micromanaging me. She's not pulling the tortilla from my hand and saying, no, this is how you do it. She's not giving me a lecture. She's allowing me to try on my own. Right. It's a very different, um, 
it's a it's a very different perspective of the child. I mean, if you go back, see, I think in our society we have this dichotomy that there's mm-hmm. either this like I'm showing the child what to do, I'm telling them what to do, I'm gonna I'm gonna like teach them, yeah, yeah, or they do whatever. And right. the book is really trying to say no, there is this other way. There is this like I'm the child has this room, like you say, to do it themselves, to feel autonomous. But I am there, and I'm gonna guide them. So with the tortilla, if I was, so tortillas take a long time to learn how to make. If I was a mom, I would be lecturing Rosie, not now, but before, I would be lecturing <laughs> Rosie about, you know, what's the best way to make a tortilla. So lots of verbal, lots of like, this is right, how you right, do it, right, instruction. Right. I would be kind of taking our hands and showing her how to do it. You know, no, not like that. Right. You know, like this very kind of, I know what's best for you. And I'm right. going to tell you about it. And you're going to listen or I'm going to get angry. Right. Um and this is like perfect, nailed it. <laughs> I'm gonna be this is this approach is I'm gonna I'm gonna watch you. I'm gonna be here next to you, doing it myself, so you can learn through observation. That's the skill that we that we're losing. Kids are amazing at it if you give them a chance and shut up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna give you some tools and, and let you do it yourself. And if, if, if I need to, if you're making a mess, if you're hurting somebody, if you're kind of overstepping some boundaries, I'm going to give you some gentle guidance hmm. and the minimal guidance. That's the M in my team is this is really the minimal. It's like, it's not nothing. And another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to watch what your skills are. Okay. So you can cut the asparagus like tonight, Rosie was cutting asparagus. You know, maybe you can use a bigger knife. Nick. Yeah. If you grab the bigger knife, I'm going to let you use it because I've been watching you. Right. And I know where you're like you just said, really I know progressive. Where I know where your yeah. skills are. I know where you're competent. And I'm going to, if need be, give you a little push every now and then to, to grow. You know, it's funny. Rosie's mm-hmm. been getting um, a little grumpy about cleaning up at night. And I don't know. There's just been some grump- grumpiness. And um, I finally said, you know, Rosie, I'm really busy. This is last night. I was like, I'm really busy with the story. Can you just do it yourself? Just do the whole thing. You know, the dishes. I'm going to, I got to finish this job. You know, and she was like, by myself I can do whatever I want and I was like yeah you know you know what to do <laughs> she's in there repainting me. the kitchen uh, yeah I mean <laughs> she ran she was running around da, 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 da. And she was like I don't know what's next mom I was like well you know do this do that and I was giving her some guidance and like she did it she cleaned that kitchen wow. I mean it wasn't perfect she's six you know but she ran the dishwasher she swept she put the table and she needed she was a little grumpy because she needed a little hmm. more freedom a little more so back to hmm. the four-year-old going to the store the part of the story you didn't say is that the mom slowly taught her that skill. Right. Right. So she, she had the sister. Thank you. Follow. She didn't just like, you know, cross that four lane highway and <laughs> no. give me some eggs. Cause I got to do this. No, yeah. Like she had right. the sister follow her for right. go with her first. Then she had their follow her without her seeing progressively. Right. And so it's this, um, this invisible kind of safety net and, mm. and the child, you know, and I also say too, that it's not linear, right? Like, right. It's like Rosie might not clean up that table that like that again for six months, you know. It's right, just, right, right. It, but it's these little growth spurts and stuff. Um, yeah, so, autonomy, relatedness, connectedness, yeah. and this yeah. is so key. I think this is if you take home one thing from this co- very yeah. complex conversation we're having, um, is to include children in your life, include children in your adult in the adult life in your life as much as you can. This, this is the connectedness when hmm. they are a part of your world. This is the crazy thing we do where we just separate them. We put them in their classes in their special kid things, their special kid, everything. And they just long to be with us and be in our world. That's where they learn to be an adult. That's where they connect. Um, and- oh, I love that. You know, and I, I was given a lecture the other day and, and it just sort of, my kids are, are senior in high school and second year in college. And a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that, that, you know, if things go as they should, I will have a relationship with these lovely people as adults much longer than I had relationships with them, you know, as children, mm. right? I mean, Rosie's not going to be six for that long, right? Yeah. But she'll be an adult for a long, long while. Um, and so that, that idea of, you know, and, and not separating them from, you know, that there's children's world and an adult world. And then, and then we wonder why they're, you know, failures to launch or, you know, the millennials do kids these days kind of thing, mm-hmm. like, you know. Um, or they just don't know how to behave right. in an adult. Say, I mean, right. 
right? We stick them in an adult setting, they act crazy. And then we're like, well, they, well, of course they do because they've only been in this, they've been around kids, right? So here's a question. So um, <laughs> in a perfect world, we would have read this book before we all had children, right? So if you, if you have fallen into a pattern where you've got a kid who's 10, 12, 15 or whatever, and you have acted like their job is to do school and extracurricular activities, and you've more or less cut them out of, of you know, being part of the, 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 the household, running the household, yeah. except for now trying to lecture them to do tours and they look at you like you're crazy because they haven't been involved how would you reestablish that? How would you try yeah. to invite them in um, in ways that, that ideally foster this opposed to it's your job to do, which, you know, then we're, yeah. we're spending a lot of energy to get a little work done. You know, it really is the same as what's in the book. It's just, a, and I, and I say this because I have used it on adults. <laughs> <laughs> multiple multiple adults where's matt where's matt we'll get i know him, him. <laughs> i know i know and not just not just you know and and to be honest like to be really honest like i had to learn this skill yeah, right yeah. like i we call, I call, in the book you know um it yeah, i use the term acomodito which is a is a spanish word that's common across mexico in indigenous families it means like paying attention to the world around you there's the attention mm -hmm. um and and knowing what to do to help and then helping, right? And 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 um and that's really what you, the goal kind of is is to teach kids. And and I realized I'm not that, right? I don't have that skill at 40, 42 when I was working on this book. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to teach all the adults in my life this skill and myself. Um, if Rosie's even gonna have a chance at it, because if she sees my me and my husband Matt, you know, arguing about who's gonna do the dishes every night. Of course, she's not going to want to do the dishes, right? But if she sees us working together mm. to clean up as a team, oh, this is like a awesome thing that the family does together. I want to be part of it, right? This drive to be part of a team is huge in young children. So I would say you use the same tools. It's just, um, and I can tell you what they are, but it's just a little lighter touch. So mm -hmm. with the little ones, you can be a little bit strong, a little stronger with it and a little more bossy, a little more. But and with, I, as I, they get older, you can't. You got to be no bossy at all because because <laughs> they're full blown. You know, any bossiness yeah. is going to push them away. So here's what you do. First of all, you make it not a big deal. It can't be a big deal, right? This is you know, but but you invite them in to just hang out with you. Hey, you know, I'm I'm cooking dinner. Come over and talk to me. So again, look at what they're interested in. Tell me about X. Show me X while I'm going to cook, right? So they don't think they're actually helping you because you don't want them to think that. And then you say, while they're there and they're talking and they're happy, you know, I say, tell me about your day, Matt, or tell me about my mom. Like, you know, tell me about your mm. friends. You know, what are you interested in? Right. And then you say, oh, hand me this from the refrigerator or put this away. So you give them these little tiny chores to do while they're standing there, you know, cut this carrot, like whatever their skill set is, you know, um, stir that pot. Oh, could you put the, that rice on, you know, and over time, you do this every day, come help me with dinner, come over and help me while I fold this laundry, just to chat to chat with me, you know, and then it's like, oh, put this in the drawer. So you give them these very tiny chores. You're boiling the frog until they're totally in your can. Okay, got it. Okay. And they don't even know, they don't even know. And over time, though, they're learning the skill, yeah. but they're also learning to enjoy it. They're learning to enjoy being with you. To, it, it becomes this collaborative thing. So it's not like, go make your bed, go do this. Let's all make the bed together and chat about, you know, what you're doing this weekend, right? It's a social event. Um, and, and slowly over time, they do learn. They do learn how to cook dinner. I'm telling you. They learn. Well, and I think, and I can, I can well imagine, uh, you know, we as a family lo love to cook. My, my son, um, TikTok loves TikTok. You know, he's got, he does the best steak. We're vegetarians. He's got the steak down cold from, you know, he's, he's nailed the steak thing mm. um, from TikTok, right? And if you go back to that, you know, competency, you're developing skills in a progressive way. Relatedness, I'm tied in, I'm having a great conversation with We're doing mom it and together, da -da -da, right? We're doing, doing it, it together. together. And, you know, gentle ask in a perfect world, you know, the, the, you're, you're, you're asking them, not forcing them. So you're That's honoring right. their, honoring their autonomy. Um, you know what the Hadzabe it. women really taught me, which I didn't understand this until the end when I was writing it, is that you can, the what you ask the person to do and how you do it, it can almost seem like you're not asking them. So what I mean, <laughs> mean by that is like the Hadzabe, every time we went somewhere and did something in Tanzania, everyone went, had a task to do, but they never really asked. They just like put a baby on my back. 
right? <laughs> they just like <laughs> stuck a water <laughs> bottle in Rosie's hand. It's just like, carry this, right? You know, hold this baby, right? Or even they don't even say anything, right? It, and, and this is a very unintrusive way versus like, oh, could you maybe, oh my gosh, will you please like this like whole like, and you're paying attention to them so you can see like what's easy for them, yeah. right? So if Rosie's hanging out with me, you know, to teach her to sit at the table. I didn't say, go sit at the table, Rosie. She's just hanging yeah. out talking with me. I hand her a fork. I'm like, put the fork on the table, right? So these, yeah. these things that like the kid just has to do fast and don't even know they're doing it. This is what you want to shoot for. This is flow. This yeah. is um, what, what is um, in the book, Lucia Alcala calls like a, one organism with multiple arms, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're just like paying attention to each other and using kind of where each other is versus making it a big deal and making it like a big, you know, go grab this, you know, this is what you want because this is, um, this is collaboration, right? I love that. Well, you know, there's a wonderful question here I'll throw out to you. When you think about one, you know, one organism with many, you know, many parts around to it, the, um, uh, Wayne writes, do grandparents have a meaningful role to play, even though the parents of the grandkids are, are doing a magnificent job themselves? You know, oh, what role do the grandparents play? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I so love this the is, This is huge. Right this is also yes. very strange that we do where we think that the mom and the dad are are really supposed to be like the primary caretakers. I mean, mm-hmm. this is very strange. So if you look throughout human history, there's a good argument to be made that children are actually small children. Human children are actually designed and evolved to be raised by probably five five people. And we're not talking about people that just kind of come in and out, but people that are really kind of connected and loving to the child as much as that's such a nice part of your book. I'm glad you reminded me of that. I really enjoyed that. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. I I just adored it. Many, many communities, a grandparent or an older person, it doesn't have to be a blood relative at all, is is a huge part of a child's life. Um, And there's several (laughs) reasons for that. Um, First of all, that they're often less. Uh, productive in the sense of like gathering food or, you know, making money, you know, they're, they're around the house more, but also, so they give like the, the, you know, the, the middle-aged person, this opportunity to go be productive, whatever that means, but also they have amazing parenting skills, right? They have watched generation, generations be raised. And so they can teach the younger people how to be a parent by showing them as well as, um, um, you know, teaching them skills. So um, in the in the Inuit community that we were with, a lot of times um, a par- the the grandma the grandparent will be almost just as much of a caretaker to the first child as the the mother, and that and that is seen as like a way. First of all, you know, it, they say you know this is their first kid; they don't know, right? And so this is like I'm going to be there. And the aunt too, and you know, right. as right. it's like a it's it's a collaborative um, uh, task. You know, when we were up there, the moms in Kugarak, this is a part of Canada, um, they could not believe that I was by myself. They were like, "What on earth are you doing, lady? Like with this kid by yourself?" <laughs> like one woman ran out of her house the second day we were there and was like, "I see you walk by here by yourself every day. You need a break. That child needs to be with somebody else. This is crazy." Like they just. This idea that one person would be with a child like that much was like. Well, my fa- my favorite line from your viewers in that book is, you know, we as parents like, I'm so sick of being with this child all the time, and and you point out like, maybe Rosie was really sick of being with me all the time. <laughs> yes, that is Sally Kukovac. She's a grandmother, and it teaches me enormous amounts. But she said that to me. She's like, you get grumpy when you're around your husband all the time. Of course, Rosie's grumpy. She's she's had too much of you. <laughs> like, lady, get away. Like, you know, so, I mean, and there's, we go back to mental health. Like Mm. this is, I think one of the most undervalued medicines of our lives is social support, right? Like, like a child feeling like they have more than just one or two people that's got their back and is with them. I mean, think about, there's data that show that like, right? Like just having one other adult that takes really a lot of interest in you as a mm-hmm. child is productive against depression. Like imagine having two or three that aren't just interested in you, but, you know, are kind of like your parents as well. Like what that does to a child feeling of like release of stress, but also feeling like support, right? And that if something happens, I got, somebody has my back. That feeling something happens, somebody has my back is likely just as important to your mental, to your health as like right. exercise and nutrition. And we do not 
value that. Um, as oh, it's such, you know, it was people probably read this, but the, um, gosh, it was a, a, the Pew Charitable Foundation did a, a survey that found of millennials, 30% of them have pur pur purport to have no friends. Oh my gosh. And we know that we know the loneliness and even, you know, with young people, but certainly in, in older years as well, is as big a risk factor, is as bad for our health as smoking cigarettes. Yeah, See, it is, it is. And, and, um, and yet, are we teaching children how to have right. friends, right? right? right. Like, right. like how to be kind to each other. Right. You know, in the book, I say, you know, there's all, all these communities have, kids have a huge amount of autonomy, but it's not right. independence. They are expected to be kind to each other, to share. They're taught how to be kind, how to share. And I, and like I said at the beginning, like I think we teach kids to be competitive. We, keep, mm -hmm. we teach kids how to show off, not share. And I think that is a big reason that kids feel lonely. It's a reason why I have felt, I have felt lonely a lot of my life. Um, and then what are we teaching them to like value with their time, yeah. right? You know, is it about making something for your neighbor and bringing it to their house, you know, together? Or is it about getting, you know, an A plus instead of an A? I see our, our, it's such a good point. I'm going to, I see, I see Charlene has joined us. I was going to ask the question about child-centered activities, but I'm, you've been listening the whole while and, and uh, um, I should, I should hand the baton back to you, the mic back to you. What, uh, what, what, what have we, what, what, what should we be talking about that we haven't yet? You know what, actually that, that would be one question, Mike, yeah. that we would love yeah. to have you speak to. We have just a few minutes together and I do want to ask you each to have some final words, but I, as a former early childhood educator, I loved your piece on how we are too focused on these separate child-centered activities, going to the museum, going to the special kids park, all the things that parents think they need to spend their weekends doing. Can you just comment on that and how, why we shouldn't be doing that? Yeah, this is also one of those 50 weird things. It's very, very weird. Like you can't find it. I never saw one child-centered activity you know, there were birthday parties, but everybody went. It's a, it was a fam, family, you know, um, it's very strange. I, I think, um, and I'll tell you that when I got back the first time before I wrote the book, I stopped it because I hate them. <laughs> I hate them. I felt like I had a child and then all of my adult life on the weekends, like vaporized. And I, like Suzanne Gaston, this anthropologist said, adult parent joined that child world. And they sacrifice their their lives. Um, so I did it for myself. But when I started doing it, when I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do on the weekends. And I'm going to modify it sometimes so Rosie can come with me. It might be shorter. It might be easier, you know. Um, but when I started doing that, her behavior improved enormously. It was incredible. You know, we would get back from like a child-centered activity, a kidney museum or something, and she would have meltdowns and be upset and screaming, you know, and we would get back from like hanging out on the beach or reading in the park or a hike and she would be relaxed, you know? And, um, and so that's one reason. So one for yourself, put your, give your life back, you know, <laughs> take your life back. Two for the kids. I, I think it is very good for their mental state to be in your world. They are designed to be in the adult world. That is where they live in every other part of the world. That's where they evolve to be. They crave it. Um, and then three, that's where they learn the skills. So for instance, Rosie was off for school over Thanksgiving break. And I got a, I got a, like a 10 year old to come look after her like five bucks an hour was amazing for some time. But I also just said, you know what? You're gonna hang out with me while I, I write radio pieces and report them. And she spent one day like 14 hours because we had like three stories like hanging out with me and you know what she's learning one she's learning to take initiative she goes over to her little desk and she figures what do i want to do what do i need to do right now? okay i'm gonna write some christmas cards she made christmas cards so that's initiative she's learning she's learning to be calm and quiet and she's learning to be a radio reporter i'll tell you that much <laughs> she is learning to be a radio reporter she's learning to tell stories she's learning about omicron right i'm not teaching her but she's just there. That is how kids learn. That is how I learned to be a reporter. I never went to school in journalism. I've never took, I took one writing class in college, but I learned by being there, by doing, by watching, 
by trying. So that's a big, long answer to your question. <laughs> but I say, no, you don't need child-centered activities. If you like them, you know, be my guest, do them. They are not necessary. Too many of them, I think, do children a disservice. And um, I think for some kids, they make them pretty, pretty self-centered, you know, because it's like, what is my purpose in this family? To go to birthday parties or to help mom, you know, at the grocery store or help mom make dinner? or, you know, learn, learn some skill. Well, and certainly all the great work of Peter Gray would say that, that play, by definition, is not adult-directed. I mean, Charlene yeah, could talk about for an hour on that alone. So, so um, um, They don't need adult-directed, right? Like, they don't... They're born like, curious. We, we, <laughs> they're born and they're curious. born to just try. They need guidance, right? There's yeah. some beautiful papers yeah. where they look at how um, Maya parents integrate the child because it is a very it's a skill to integrate a child into an adult task right and that, the book gives you some of those skills mm -hmm. um but it is these these parents it's masterful there's this one um there's this one time where the little two-year-old wants to help the grandpa um uh put a cement floor in well clearly a two-year-old can't put a cement floor in but the, the grandfather allows him to try a little bit kind of gives him some guidance and then like over like a five or ten minutes and says oh I think I hear your mom calling so he never even though the mom wasn't calling so he never actually pushes the child away he lets the child be there a little bit lets the child try and then when it gets mm -hmm. kind of be too much like does it in a way that doesn't discourage the child from coming back well, that was a beautiful answer, Michaeline, and I could not agree more. My parenting claim to fame is I have never been to Chuck E. Cheese. Gonna keep oh, it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> See, you should go back like now it. as a date night, no children, just to take it in. <laughs> the th anthropological study, maybe you can do a, you can write, a, write an article with Michaeline. Exactly. So listen, <laughs> last last words of advice for parents tonight, both of you. You have both written books that I consider seminal for really helping parents. So mm. Ned, let's start with you. You know I love your books. You've read Michaeline's book. What do you most want parents to walk away with? Well, you know, I, uh, there's there's a lot of overlaps between how, how Michaeline thinks about this as, as and, and Bill and I, but something we've been focusing on a lot, and I think it really comes through in 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 everything that she shared tonight in her book, is just how important is a close connection mm. between parents and children that we know that if there's a silver bullet against the effects of stress on these, these so malleable but vulnerable developing young minds, it's having a close connection to one or more adults. And so with our actions and our words, we, if, we, if we can keep that relationship at the center of it and you know, messes be darned, um, and, and, and you can feel it. If you're frustrated with your child, your child can feel it too. And so much of it is we, we, we want to be thinking about how can we change our energy? Because if we create this environment, children are born curious and born, as you make, as, Chris, as Michaeline points out so well, naturally born to want to help. And if we, if we, we can support that and nurture it and, and not snuff it out, because, I mean, we, we, we have children because we want to be close to them. Thank you, Bella. That's yeah, sorry, that's really beautiful. You know, Bev and I do this program. We love parents. We love you, parents. But we do it because we love kids, and we know that really great parent education, like tonight, changes the lives of children. Michaeline, I'm going to give you the last word. You know, on that first trip, 2018. Oh my gosh, like um, to the Yucatan. Suzanne Gaskin said to me, I asked her this, like, you know, what can what can American European American parents like really learn and she said you know just be quiet yeah you know like just that's one of the crazy things we do is we talk all the time at our children and yeah. when you're talking you can't watch them you can't you can't learn what they're doing you can't see what they're doing and I think for a lot of kids all those words for Rosie are really stressful especially when they're little it's so stimulating it's so stressful and so when I was first working on this book I would just take her somewhere outside to the beach, to the park, to the library even, and just say, you know, we're just gonna be quiet for 20, 20 30 minutes. We're not gonna say a word to each other <laughs> and try it. I think it, it, it brings us a connect. It's crazy, it sounds crazy, but it connects us. Mm. It calms us down. Mm. You know, we'll go to a restaurant or a cafe, we'll order and I'll just be like, you know, let's just sit here and be quiet. You know, or just, I'll be quiet and she'll just come with me. 
because like Ned just said, whatever energy you're bringing, children will mirror you. Um, so that's one advice. And the second thing is just stop arguing with them. No parents on the planet argue and negotiate and bicker and nag. I mean, that's one of the things that stands out when you travel places. They just, parents say something, do something, and then that's really it. If the child's going to hurt themselves, they move them or they move the, the, the tool or whatever. There's just like, there's just no arguing. And that has changed my relationship with Rosie a lot. I just stopped, you know, you, just, you don't need to, there's other ways. Drop the rope. Um, yeah. And just like, there's this one, um, there's this woman at UCLA that studies American middle class American kids, um, families. Um, she's an anthropologist, but she studies, um, you know, us, so to speak. Um, and, um, and she has this great, uh, description of a, of a father who spends 10 or 15 minutes in the morning negotiating who's going to tie the eight-year-old's shoes. <laughs> and this is in front of the, the, the scientist, right? And she documents like where he gives up his power, where he becomes like unequal with the child. And it, it really, you know, and every parent in the book would be like, well, first of all, not tell an eight-year-old to tie their shoes. Like that's, you know, beyond the pale. But like they would tell him once and if the kid doesn't tie his shoes, like, he's going to learn once he trips over it. <laughs> right. You know, so it's just kind of like, it's okay if they don't listen. Move on. <laughs> Move on. All you're teaching them is to argue and negotiate with you. Really sorry, you that is really great advice. I spent 10 years at being teaching early childhood at Stanford and we learned that the best teachers talk the least. Oh, there mm. you go. You learn, you learn yeah. to set the stage and let the children take over the play. You yeah. don't you don't yak at them, and we do. Oh, I love it. Well, again, thank you both so much, Ned Johnson and Michaeline Duclub, for a beautiful conversation. Take care, everybody. We hope to see you again. If you guys can stay on for a minute, fantastic. But I want to say thank you again to you both, Michaeline and Ned. This was wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. Take care and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.